The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon China Report. Again, we are in Israel, in Jerusalem, Israel. We're talking with uh, a young minister, young in looks, young in thought, young in everything. Her name is Tsipi Livni. She's the Minister of Housing as of yesterday and Minister of Absorption, I guess, from a longer time. I knew her father. He was a terrific man. His name was Eitan Livni. He's one of my first associations in Israel. And uh, he was a, a fundamentally a very a strong uh, Zionist, and that's the best way to describe him, right-wing Zionist, I would say. Tippy, welcome to the show. Thank you. So you're very active now. You've got two ministries. You've got a prime minister that's a little bit uh, hung up now into some kind of quabble with his Likud party. I think you're a pretty good backer of Sharon at this moment, aren't you? Yes, because I believe in uh, what he's doing. Uh... Do you think that a, a central party or a, uh, a committee of, of a, any party, Likud or Labour, should dictate the foreign policy of a country? Uh, I believe that this is what the vast majority in Israel believes in. And uh, you mentioned my father. And on his grave, there's, it, it is the two both sides of Jordan River as Israel. And really? It, yes, really. By his request as part of his will. And... Uh, I believe that uh, the Jewish people has the rights all over the land of Israel, but there's a need for us to keep Israel as a Jewish and democratic state, and that's why I believe that there's, there is the time in which we have to compromise. And I believe that what I represented now represent vast majority in Israel. Unfortunately, it's not easy to do. There is no partner on the other side. The Palestinians cannot accept yet the existence of Israel as as, as a Jewish state, but uh, I believe that we'll have to choose at the end of the day between all of the land and between keeping Israel as a Jewish state and democracy while these both two values are, are, being, uh, are going together, uh, combined and not uh, going one against the other. What made people like your father, Chaim Landau, they were such stern Zionists, they, they had no interest in money, what what brought them to this position? They were fascinating men. I mean, I was a young kid when I met them, and it was always interesting to talk to them. But they, they used to call up begging all the say, I'm a fakid all the I'm time. Fakid, Come yes. You remember that? <laughs> I remember as a child, while, yeah. while begging, uh, was, was calling my father, he answered the phone, I'm fakid, you know. Right. What, what put them into, what was their backbone? It was tremendous. Uh, I spoke with my father. I entered politics after my father uh, died. By the way, Hamad Fakade means commander. Commander, so, yes. Right, right. So uh, I spoke with my father, and after the State of Israel was established, he was uh, uh, elected to the parliament, and, right. but he said that the most important things he, uh, he did before the establishment of the State of Israel for the establishment of the State of Israel. And what happened afterwards, it's so less important for him, you know, even though he was a member of parliament and all, the, all the, the things connected with the party. It was very important for him to create something new, real homeland. For Where was he born, your father? He was born in uh, Lita. Lithuania? Lithuania. But he came to Israel in uh, 1925 as a child. So he's merely almost uh, was born in Israel. But uh, uh, he believed that uh, the most important uh, um, goal is to, to establish a secured state for generations to come. And uh, this is what they done, both of them, by the way, also my mother. Really? Yes. She was it, a fighter also in the Yagon. It is said that you have children? Uh, I have two. It's said that people take values from their parents. 
basically. I believe so. No, I believe that too. So, obviously you have your father's values. Would he look at solving this problem by recognizing Palestinian state? What do you think? Even though it looks like we changed uh, our ideology, I don't think so. I believe that what I represent today is part of the education or the values that I was raised upon. I mean, it was not only about the land of Israel, but it was about uh, the establishment of Israel as a Jewish state with values of, uh, as you said before, he never spoke about uh, uh, money. It was about values, about justice, about uh, uh, believing in people, well, he was believing a in the man. Jewish people. Right. And when it comes all together, unfortunately, we have to choose because I cannot get it all. And that's why by choosing and because I believe that there's a need for us to combine our values as a Jewish state and a democracy, there's a need for me to compromise. I'm sure that it would have been difficult for him maybe to see or to hear what, what I say today, but my mother, who was also part of the Irgun, who fought, she fought with him for the establishment of the State of Israel, and she once told me that it's very difficult for her to, to, to accept it, but she understands now that they fought for our future, and I have to take tough de decisions for the future of my children, her grandchildren. And I believe that it, th this is what I'm doing as part of, of what I was raised upon. Uh, was your father a religious man? He was traditional. I mean, it, it's a kind of a combination between... Uh, uh, he believed in the Jewish people, and not only... Uh, and the, the, the Jewish uh, uh, people, it's not only being religious. So it was very important for him to to keep some of the traditions. Both, uh, some of the traditions the connection he went to synagogue but he was not he, but he was not religious i mean he kept part of it because it was very important for him to keep something which is the the common denominator between us between him and between the jews in diaspora this is the connection between the jews who are living today and between those who were living in in the land of Israel thousands and thousands of years ago. All right, but that's a key issue now in Israel because you believe as a Likud person that you've got to give up some land for peace. There are people who believe that uh, you don't give up any land, period. Okay. So how do you overcome that? Um, as I said before, uh, I believe that vast majority in Israel and also within Likud members understands that there's a need to compromise. I believe that only few of uh, Likud members uh, believe that time is working for us and that's why we should wait, do nothing, and... Uh, this was Shamir, basically. Shamir and some of my friends in, in Uzi the Landau on this show, Benny Begin on this show, said that they would never recognize a Palestinian state. On this show, we have tapes. Uh, but Uzi Landau, by the way, I asked him because I said, listen, I, I, I would like to understand if you believe that you will never give, give up only even a small yeah. piece of land. Right. And he said, no, today, even he says, Is that, right? that there's a need to, to, to do painful concessions. And when we are talking about painful concessions, we are talking about the land. But there are differences within among us. I mean, there are some people saying that they will never give up part of the land. There are some people saying that they will give up part of the land only when terror stops. There are some people saying that they will give up part of the land uh, only when a final status agreement will be uh, signed both sides, so when they'll find a part partner on the Palestinian side. But it's like accepting the concept, but you know, the, the difference is not in, uh, not well, in the concept. Well, they're nuances. We're both lawyers, yes. so there are a lot of yes, nuances. Yes. So, so we, we can agree upon the concept. But can you unite with Sharon today? Can we could unite behind Sharon? Um, 
I'm sure that we can, but unfortunately politics is not only about the need of the people, but sometimes about the need of politicians. And many times. Many times, yes. This was the understatement of the year, I believe <laughs> what I said. And uh, I tried to, because after the Likud referendum, uh, a few months ago, on uh, June, uh, the, it looks like we are going to, to, to split the, the party. And I said, listen, it's too, we don't have to do it because we can accept the idea of uh, giving up part of the land. There are some differences between us. Let's wait and see because there are preparations for to be done and that's why I uh, arranged or I helped in, in uh, getting an understanding between uh, the Likud leaders, I mean between Ariel Sharon on one side and between Bibi Netanyahu, Limor Livanat and Silvan Shalom. How much gray hair did you get out of there? How much gray hair did you get out of <laughs> A lot, but it was interesting, I can say. <laughs> and, uh, but it took only a few weeks, and even yesterday there were still discussions about that. Uh, Do you get tired of this sometimes? You are a successful lawyer. Yes, and thank you. And having a nice life. This is a tough life. But it gives me power to be in politics knowing that I have other alternatives outside. I mean, I like to practice law, right. I earn my living, and uh, that's why I can do in politics what I believe in. I mean, I don't have to survive in politics. I don't need it. Right. And that's why I'm doing what I believe is, as I said before, my uh, uh, father fought for the existence of the, the, the State of Israel. And I believe that I'm working for a better life for my children. Never in my experience of politics would Menachem Begin have faced a revolution in the Likud party once he made a decision. And I can tell you from my own experience in Camp David 1, the successful one, that I once came to Menachem Begin and uh, uh, engineered a, a compromise between President Carter and Begin and I said, Mr. Prime Minister, President Carter wants to know if you can carry the party. And he said to me in his Polish English, I will carry the party, don't worry. He had no, uh, no problem with it. And he had Moshe Aaron's up there and he had Shamir. These are guys who abstained. And he had my father, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> against, uh, it, it was difficult for my father to accept. I know, I know, I heard so. it personally. <laughs> so, uh, times per change, I mean, nobody respects anymore the leaders. Uh, maybe we earned it, by the way, uh, the lack of re respect from the public. Uh, but uh, um, I believe that there is a difference between the Central Committee of the party and between Likud voters and Likud members. I mean, most of Likud voters believes, believe in what Ariel Sharon is doing, and maybe even most of Likud members. Within the Central Committee, it is totally politics. I mean, I, I, met, I went through the referendum to the polls, and I met some of the people. So some of them told me that they cannot accept the idea because of ideological reasons that I can respect it and, and even understand it. But some of them were angry at Sharon because of this and that. It, so it was all mixed with mo emotions and with uh, anger. And it, it was not pure decision about what is right to the state of Israel and to the future of Israel, unfortunately. Will there be new elections early? I hope. I hope not, because uh, it's important, the stability of the Israeli government. I, I mean, by the law, we have elections every four years, right. but in the last ten years, we have elections every two years. Yeah, we um, interviewed a psychiatrist, and we asked what it meant to the population to have such an unstable okay. government. And it obviously causes unbelievable stress and, yes. and, and no fixation. So what people do is they detach from the news. They don't read newspapers. They don't listen to television. Like and some and so what happens then, and it's interesting theory, is zealots are the ones that do it. And a minority of the people who read newspapers da -da 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 -da, and have this ideology, they start to control the country. Ah, uh, okay, but in Israel most of the people are, uh, well, I mean, we have news every half an hour on the radio. We cannot open a station without hearing the news, unfortunately, by the way, because like yesterday, at the middle of the day, you right. have, you have uh, an understanding that uh, they were two suicide bombers and uh, uh, 
you know, everybody has children or brothers in the army, so, so, so there's a need for us to be con as citizens to know what's happening. Yeah, but what I say is people turn off. I was sitting in a uh, kosher restaurant with a former government employee in a very orthodox place, Shmulka Kohn or something, I don't know, Tel Aviv, and they said in Hebrew that there was an incident. And uh, everybody said, put on the television. And, uh, and she said, do you want the kugel? <laughs> you know, it was like a routine of life. It's become part of the, the, the life of Israel. And uh, unfortunately, but also we in America are suffering from the same thing. There's a lot of fear, even in this New York City where I live, that there will be a 9-11. I, um, I did interviews, I told you, with the dean of the Kennedy School. He said it's not a question of, of if it's going to be, it's just when. Everybody believes that it's going to happen. So in Israel, it would seem to me that maybe the people could unite a little bit better behind their government so they can move it. I, I, I tell you, I must admire Sharon because it's a reversal of a lot of his old policies for him to make this move. I mean, this is what one calls uh, leadership. This is really leadership. When you can reverse such doctrines that you had, because you, if you go back and get tapes, he was the guy that put the settlements there. And he's fighting, he's fighting very strongly for it. And I think uh, the American government appreciates it very much. I, I, you know, I really don't know what will happen over here, but I think it's important that uh, credibility be kept. And I don't know how you get that to, to, to your people in Likud. I just, I don't, I don't know. calls for this statesmanship. Is, uh, yes, as I said before, maybe more than that, because uh, unfortunately there are some people looking, as you, said, as you asked before, maybe an election now. Uh, you are facing Simply, an election. You talk to these people, and some yes. of them are very intelligent. And they'll say to you, but we can't give up the land. You know, we, we just can't do it. It's part of our heritage. It's, it's uh, era, the, the, the Eretz Yisrael Shlema. And they're intelligent people, and their kids are getting killed all the time in these settlements. What kind of psyche do they have? Uh, as, uh, some of them are believers. Right. I mean, they believe that maybe in the future something will happen. But as I said before, most of Likud members and most of Likud parliament members are not holding the idea of never uh, give up some of the land. Mostly they are thinking that they know better, that they, we should do it with, from another, I don't know, from, uh, with an agreement. Or, and I'm trying to tell them that, first of all, it's risky. Listen, even deciding this decision of the disengagement plan, it's not an easy decision. So it's risky. And it's much more easier to say no. <laughs> but usually what I say, and this is true to the Likud within Israel and to Israel among the international community, there is no vacuum between, uh, when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And when uh, the Likud party knew to say only no, train left the station and bad train. Oslo agreement was a mistake. Absolutely. And uh, it was because Shamir hesitated, Madrid, and so on. And then, uh, so we got Oslo Agreement. And then uh, Netanyahu hesitated, and we got Barak with Camp David, which part of the agreement, oh, it's not an agreement, but the understanding in Camp David are very difficult, and, and they are also a mistake. So I'm trying to explain Likud members, listen, our role is to lead this country and to initiate and there is no, you know, when it comes to solving the conflict, or the, I'm not even talking in terms of living in peace, uh, uh, eternal peace, uh, happily ever, or to live happily ever after, because we are talking about living in non-violent status quo in the near future. This is the goal right now, unfortunately. And there's a need to initiate. And it's risky, but we can do some steps to be sure that we are not putting Israel at risk. And if we not do it, Labour Party will do it. Because most of the people in Israel, they want, they, they see peace, they dream about peace, they want the initiatives. And it's true, it is true also when it comes to Israel with, among the international community. When Israel initiates nothing, well, somebody has his own plan. 
It can be also Israel opposition. And yeah, uh, you're very logical. And if I really could, I would be listening to you and understand it. What? Uh, I don't, un well, I don't understand, I don't know how you move them, is the diehards. I don't know how you do it. I know that Ruby Rivlin, who's a good friend of mine, is a, an ideologue and doesn't believe in a Palestinian state, doesn't believe, but he's democratic. And if the, if the Knesset votes to do what you want to do, he'll go along with it. He has his own position, but democratically, he'll move with it. Uh, uh, okay, so on. No, no, go ahead. No, I'd like to say something. No, I, I know that also here people are, are using... Uh, his ideology, uh, ideologue, he believes in the right. land of Israel. I believe that I'm also, uh, uh, it's not the lack of ideology by uh, the decision of doing something like this, like the disengagement plan or, or like giving up some of the land. It's not lack of ideology. It's more complex ideology. It's, realistic. it's not only It's not only about the land, but it's about the future life of our, our children. It's about the values that we will grow upon. So it is more complex, but it, this is also part of the values that we have. But it is not only, you know, one flag. We have, we have some, and we have to decide which is more maybe important or, or more realistic, as you say, for today. And um, this is why I believe that at the end of the day, things will happen, and we will move toward, toward something better. But unfortunately, we spoke about Likud members and about our party and about Israel. But there's a need also to find on the other side <laughs> leadership. Right. Somebody to talk with, somebody who believes really in peace, not terrorists. People who, who are not only talking in terms of two-state solutions. People solution. think that if Arafat were out of the picture, that there are people to talk to. Abu um, Mazen, Abu Maybe Allah. in the future, maybe in the future. Do you talk, by the way, to uh, PLO people? Yes, yes, yes. And how do you find them? Well, it's not on a personal basis. No, I don't mean, uh, that, no. I, I mean Okay. Do they listen? Uh, some of them are listening. Uh, some of them are very manipulative, especially when it comes to third parties like the Europeans or the Americans. And there is nobody, unfortunately, that can uh, not only speak against our fact, but do something which is not under the leadership of, of Arafat. And uh, I think that this is now an understanding, an international understanding, that Arafat is an obstacle. As lo and we are paying the region, uh, maybe, maybe the world, is paying the price of the ego of one person, bombastically untrustworthy, terrorist, which is still... Uh, um, I don't know, in, in a strange way, uh, the hero of the Palestinians, and, and, and both, both sides, Palestinians and Israelis, and as I said before, it affects the world, are paying the price of this, uh, of this person. All right, we had a cut for a break. We'll come right back and talk with Tippi Livney. She was very instrumental in having George Bush and his administration take the uh, right of return off the table, and that is a huge doctrine. We've talked about it many times on this show. I personally have compared it to the uh, Balfour Declaration because it's institutionalized in foreign policy. We'll be right back. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend Killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the Backdoor Channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian Peace Treaty. Become a witness to history and order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all of the retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order Backdoor Channels. 
Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Available now over iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Leon Charney's cantorial CD in Disco Lam. Listen as Charney movingly sings El Mole Rachamim and Charney's amazing rendition of a disco remix of Adon Olam, all sung in the incredible and individual Charney style. Also listen to the CDs on Rhapsody. Download Leon Charney's cantorial songs in Disco Lam, the disco remix of Adon Olam on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Or listen in on Rhapsody, all available now. We're back. We're talking with Sipi Livni. I'm in Israel, Jerusalem, the uh, holy city of, uh, I guess, David started this thing, King David, and uh, look where we are. A lot of people want to get connected to it. Now it's Israel's Jerusalem, and there will be uh, future fights over Jerusalem, which we'll talk about with uh, Sipi. But are you upset? With the International Court of The Hague and the way the Israeli government handled it, you think they should have been more on top of it than... And A, and B, is it a dangerous thing for Israel? Uh, it is dangerous, and mostly I cannot understand it. I, I, I will explain. Uh, and I believe that at the end of the day, we could have known from the beginning that this is going to be the... the verdict. The verdict, uh, regardless what Israel would have done or, or say. And this is something I cannot understand because, and this is also part of uh, the hypocrisy of Palestinians, because I can hear the last uh, years uh, people are talking in terms of two-state solution and the need to divide the land of Israel between Jordan River and Mediterranean Sea for two. Now, because of security reasons, there was a need for us to give people, to give them life. I mean, we are facing terrorist attacks. We, we, we are burying today children and people that were killed and because of these security reasons we decided to build this fence and the day we made this decision there was a strange position in which extreme right in Israel took against the fence <laughs> with Palestinians because the right wing of political map in Israel understands that at the end of the day there's the meaning of dividing the land by the fence, regardless to the exact line of the fence. And the same day, we decided to build the fence, even regardless it was not decided where the, where the line will be. I found the Palestinians, you asked me about meeting Palestinians, I was in a convention in Germany, and this is something that my father never would have done, going to Germany. But it was important for Israel and... Uh, Benny Begin will never go to Germany. It was the first time that I was in Germany because I believe that it is important to represent Israel. And I met Palestinians and they spoke about the defense in terms of Berlin Wall. And I said, what is the matter with you? I mean, Berlin Wall divided one people for two. And the whole idea is to uh, uh, divide two people who are living between Jordan River and Mediterranean Sea. For two, you can say that you are not accepting the exact line. Okay, this is something that I can understand, but this is totally not Berlin Wall. And more than that, when it comes, to, this is also part of, of the values, what looks like the values of the international community. No, you're both lawyers. And there is a distinct, distinction in any penal code, in every democratic state between a murderer and between somebody who killed uh, uh, by mistake. There's a difference between giving life to somebody and between uneasiness that maybe it caused to other. And when it comes to defense, 
there's a need for me to give life or to secure the life of Israeli citizens. I know that some of them are living in blocks of settlements. Okay. But I have to choose between their life and between the uneasiness of a farmer to go to his field. Excuse me? I believe that any person with his right mind, any moral person, would have made the same decision or the same choice. But I can see now the international community, not all, not, not all of them are talking in terms of, but it's very difficult for Palestinians. And more than that, we are changing all our defense systems until now, uh, and because unfortunately the Palestinian society embraced these terrorists within the, the, the Palestinian cities, we have, we have our soldiers within the cities trying to, to, to find the terrorists. And by putting the fence, it could make their life easier because we can take our soldiers and put them near the fence and give security only to, to part of the settlements that are on the other side of the fence. And about 90% of the West Bank is on the east side of the fence. I mean, what are you talking about? And for me, it is also a, a kind of another evidence to the unfortunate, the sad understanding that the Palestinians are talking in terms of two-state solution, but they are not accepting it. And what the Europeans are expecting for us? I mean, in, in, in Europe, on, it took 50 years to take off the borders. When it comes to two-state solution, we are not going to live with open borders like in Europe the first week. Okay? It will take us also some time. So why wasn't so, Israel more preactive, uh, proactive here? I mean, uh, they, you could see this. In explaining. Uh, sure, the foreign ministry should have been out front. And now you have other problems. You have Mazuz, who's your attorney general, yes. who wants to, in a sense, incorporate the findings of the International Court of The Hague. You have Aram Barak, who, with your Supreme Court, who precludes you from moving that fence someplace. There are many who say that the terrible incident in Beersheba yesterday might have been prevented had you had some kind of fence in Hebron. We could save lives. Because yeah, so, so how do you put it all together? Uh, I believe that the legal aspect is only one of the aspects that we have to, to, to deal with because our responsibility is not only take legal aspects. And I believe that if we we'll take offense only over Tel Aviv, it will be accepted by the international community. Okay, but this is only one aspect, the legal aspect. I have responsibility for the life of people who are living partially, maybe not uh, 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 in settlement, and I have to take some responsibility in uh, 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 taking uh, or, or not giving up some of our um, uh, assets for the future negotiation. So we, re we have to, to establish or to build this fence because of security reasons, but it's not only legal matter. It's more than that. It is very complex, but the legal issue is only on, only a part of it. Were you upset when you saw these things happen, or you yes. understand that you were? Yes, yes. And yes. Uh, do you think the Supreme Court should have a hand in this also? I mean, you're a lawyer. I believe that uh, the Supreme... I, I believe that the uh, judgment was a mistake, also legally, also when it comes to the legal aspects. I believe that it's not the uh, role of the Supreme Court in Israel to judge if you can give better security from this top of the hill or the other top yeah, of the hill. Yeah, you're giving that to, how many on your yes. court, 11 or 9, I don't remember. Uh, this this, uh, this uh, session, I, I, I don't recall. But generally you're 11, am I right? No, no I don't it started from 3 to 11, it depends on... Uh, no, because the United but, States is 9. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is my problem as somebody who was elected to decide what to do. And it's not, uh, you know, dry legal uh, uh, aspect with the, to check the, the, the books and the balance. So do you think you could ever have a constitution in this country? Oh, I hope so, because one of the mistakes that we've done is to say, uh, I spoke at the beginning of, of the interview, uh, it was very clear that Israel was established as a Jewish and democratic state, but nobody knows what's the real meaning of these two values. I mean, everybody knows what's the what 
a democracy is, and if you ask uh, children in the street, they will quote, I, I think they will quote the Fifth Amendment or something because they are watching the American uh, television. TV television. But we have also to decide what's the meaning of Israel as a Jewish state. What is a Jew? I ask this of everybody. I asked David Omar, what, what is a Jew? Uh, People have struggles with it. Uh, I asked the Ravitz, he was very clear. A Jew is a man who follows Torah. Period. But there, I ask Asa Weiss from what a Jew is, and it, he's, he's cultural and historical, and he doesn't talk that much, and it's very complex. It is very complex. More than, this is the, maybe the most complex question, but more than that, even after an understanding, what is the meaning of being a Jew, it is more complex to decide what is the meaning of being a Jewish state. I mean, a state is not practice religious. Correct. And we are not, so I believe that it's more about the tradition or the symbols that we spoke about at the beginning when I spoke about my father, it's about, it's about the flag, it's about the anthem, it's about Jerusalem, it's capital. It's about uh, Shabbat, about Saturday as, as the day off, it's about uh, holidays, it's about, it's about what, uh, at the end of the day, this is the real common denominator between Israelis and Jews in the Do you think there would be a Jewish state if there was no Holocaust? <laughs> Oh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you got enough problems in the cabinet. I don't want to knock you out um, over here. The movement or the Zionist movement started before and we got the Balfour Declaration in, uh, before the Holocaust. So it was a kind of process toward this goal. Uh, but I don't know. But you know, what's what, you know what's worrying me the most? That I know that if the United Nations would have, oh, uh, uh, the would, UN resolution, the UN resolution, one eight one, if they will have the possibility to redecide of the establishment of the state, they will of Israel, revoke it. Yes. I agree. And this is something that goes underneath. It's about the legitimacy of Israel as a Jewish state among the international community. And this is, and there is a kind of an unwillingness of within Israel is to, to, to this process. And, um, you know, I heard uh, Kofi Annan in Durban. It was few weeks, two weeks, I think, before September 11th. And he said that the Holocaust doesn't give you the right, you, the Jewish people, Israel, I know, to do certain things. And one of them was to, to displace people. And this is regarding displacement, it regard, he meant to the establishment of the state of Israel. Because this is something that happened while the state of Israel was established and because of the war that the Arab world declared on Israel. So in a way, even maybe without an understanding, he said something that the meaning is that the Holocaust doesn't give you the right to establish your own state. All right, we're going to come for a break, and I have two big questions for you. Number one, Abu Vilan, who was a member of the Merits Party, had an article in Aritz a couple, two, three weeks ago saying that he's afraid of a civil war. And uh, I want your opinion on that. And then I want to talk to you about how do you keep the demographics Jewish in this state? Okay. We'll be right back. Tippi's going to think about those answers. And uh, I'm sure she'll come back with something that's realistic. As you can tell, she's a realistic woman. <clears throat> In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the Backdoor Channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian Peace Treaty. Become a witness to history and order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order Backdoor Channels. 
Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Available now over iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Leon Charney's cantorial CD in Disco Lounge. Listen as Charney movingly sings El Mole Rachamim and Charney's amazing rendition of a disco remix of Adon Olam, all sung in the incredible and individual Charney style. Also listen to the CDs on Rhapsody. Download Leon Charney's cantorial songs in Disco Lam, the disco remix of Adon Olam on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Or listen in on Rhapsody, all available now. We're back. I'm Leon Charney. We're talking with Tippi Livni, who's the Minister of Absorption and Housing as of yesterday in housing. And she's a real uh, a supporter of Sharon and his cabinet, and believe me, he can use good support at this point. Uh, Tippi, did you read that article about uh, the possibility of a civil war? Unfortunately, only the headlines. Oh. Do you believe there could be a civil war here within six months? I hope not, and I spoke with some of the settlers trying to explain them that uh, at the end of the day we share the same values and there are uh, mutual goals that we can work together, like flourishing the Negev and the Galilee and, uh, and other places, and we can go together. And uh, it is not less important the strength of Israel society. And. Uh, we spoke about uh, Begin. He said uh, years ago that there will never be a, a war between brothers in Israel. I when I say Allah you know. Talena, what does that do to you? Um, Allah Talena was a ship that the Ben Gurion ordered, uh, fired upon. Uh, Yitzhak Rabin happened to be the guy at the at the helm, and this was a group trying to bring in some ammunition. Uh, at the beginning of the state of Israel, and it became a huge problem between the uh, Hayrut party at that time and, and Ben Gurion, and it was a huge decision. If you talk to her father or Chaim Landau, they would really have a tough time swallowing it. Yes, it's it, it, it's a kind of uh, the feeling is a feeling of uh, haunted minor minority in your own uh, in your own state. Right. Your, is it still name. there? You think, or it's dissipated? Uh, for me, it's not a matter of I'm not angry anymore, but um, it was not only Antalena, but the way history was taught in Israel to the people my age about my father and mother and their did for the establishment of the state of Israel. It, it was totally uh, misinterpreted, and uh, so I have still. Uh, the feeling of uh, being, I cannot say unwanted, but uh, having totally different uh, uh, background than my friends in school. Interesting. All right, demographically, how do you keep Israel a Jewish state? Aliyah, 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 bringing you're, Jews to Israel, calling the them to come. There are six million Jews in North America, come to Israel, live with us. This is your place. Thank you. How are they? Uh, how is your immigration now? Is it? By the way, Yitzhak Shamir told me the greatest uh, thing that he accomplished as prime minister was bringing a million Russian Jews here. Yes, it it it, it is. Uh, it was very important. It is still important, but uh, you know, in Russia now the numbers are reduced. So and there are million new immigrants in Israel, and it made wonderful to so change the Israel economy, change Israel society, uh, but we need more people to come, and the, the largest uh, Jewish community in the world now is in North America. So I believe that uh, Zionism is not, uh, is not uh, ended. 
and uh, there's, there's a need to, to encourage these people to come, to live in Israel, because I think that uh, sometimes when I, I, I met one, one of a Jewish leader in, in North America, and I, to, I told him that I'm a minister for immigrant absorption, and he said, okay, you have a wonderful job to bring all these Russians to Israel, or the Ethiopian Jews, and I said, listen, but this is not their fit. I mean, I, I think that some of uh, the Jews in diaspora believe that the job was done. I mean, we established the state of Israel, and we have to fight terror and uh, come to an agreement with the Palestinians, and, and this is the end of. of and, and this is, uh, 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 and we made it. But it's not. How, yet. how do you encourage people to come? I mean, it's your ministry. Uh, within my ministry, we are trying to ease their life while they are coming. I mean, there is uh, what we call uh, um, immigrants uh, absorption basket money that they got, we are trying to, to give them the possibility to learn Hebrew, to, to practice, to find to find job, to integrate into Israel society. I believe in young in young people because uh, it's it's more difficult for um, people with with family, parents to take the children to come, but when we are talking about young people we can uh, offer them uh, three years in uh, Israel University for free. This is something that Israelis don't uh, don't have. But really? New, yes, but new... new uh, you new see any immigration from France now? Yes, <coughs> more than what used to be in the past, but not enough. There are about half a million uh, Jews in France, but only 2,000 or 3,000 are coming a year, so this is nothing. All right. The Ministry of Housing, you just got it. Yes. The tick, as they say, the file. What does the Ministry of Housing do? Ministry of Housing uh, is uh, in charge on uh, planning the future places in which uh, future cities and towns uh -huh. is as well. Building some it's a huge ministry, isn't it? Yes. Interesting. I think I Ari Sharon was uh, yes. right. Yes. Uh, for the rock, but when Ari, Ari Sharon was minister for housing, I didn't know him, and I practiced law in the private sector, and they decided to build uh, five or seven new cities in Israel. And uh, as a lawyer, I, one, I, I uh, advised or. Uh, I cannot say that I build the cities, but as a lawyer, I you represent people. Yes, I represent people. Yes. Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, you can create settlements, and is that within your power too? It is in my power, not only in my only power, because to build new settlements, there's a need for authorization, not only from the Ministry of Housing, but also from the Ministry of uh, the Minister of Defense and <laughs> Prime Interior. Minister. Wow. And, uh, but uh, he was a bulldozer with that, Sharon. He built. He, he was a strong guy. Settlements. Yeah. Not anymore. <laughs> we are not doing it anymore. And now the, the, the uh, part of our vision is to, uh, parallel to the disengagement plan, is to strengthen what we call blocks of settlements, uh, but uh, not to be new settlements. One of the things that we spoke about before, and you said was maybe your proudest moment, when you convince Condoleezza Rice and the Bush administration uh, to take yes, this right of return yes, off the map, yes. it was not only my 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 my. With, Were you the progenitor? Uh, listen, I watched Eud Barak in Camp David, and for the first time, I understood that an Israeli government is talking in terms of two-state solution on one hand. And my logical understanding was that two state the meaning of two-state solution is one is Israel, the uh, homeland for the Jewish people that was established also after the Holocaust, that gave home for all these refugees that went, left Europe and Arab state, fled the Arab states. We called them to come and we gave them new home. So the future Palestinian state should have been uh, uh, the answer to the Palestinians wherever they are, those who are living in the territories and those who, are, who left in, in, in 48. And unfortunately, I found out that there are some uh, misunderstanding because people are talking in terms of two-state solution on one hand, but on the other hand, they are going back to Oslo saying, OK, there's a need to give an answer to certain issues, uh, settlements, borders, Jerusalem, and refugees. So it looks like 
it's it, it uh, unconnected issues they are and I, I believe that there's a need to to make this connection between right. the establishment of Palestinian state and the fact is that the, the establishment of Palestinian state takes off the Israeli table, the Jewish state out of the two states, the question of refugees, from any aspects. And meanwhile, a Palestinian state became fact. I mean, everybody on the, even though it was not established yet, everybody in the international community looks like, like it is a fact. And then I read an article of Yasser Arafat explaining his vision about the Palestinian state, and it was about 67 borders, Jerusalem, its capital. And the second paragraph started with the words, in addition, there's a need to find a, 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 a solution to the refugees. And he mentioned in his, what was called moderate article, that if the question of refugees will remain unsolved, the conflict will remain unsolved. So were you and the first to pick this up? Yes. Really? Yes. And I explained it in Israel, because in Israel, you know, we are easy. I mean, most of the people but say... you have a foreign ministry. They're supposed to read these it's things. It's more than foreign ministry. Listen, I, I uh, try to explain it in uh, cabinet meetings. Uh, they didn't understand in addition? They said, listen, at the end of the day, nobody, we will say no. And I said, it's not, if we'll come to a position in the future, in which a Palestinian state will be a fact. The world, the international com uh, uh, community will t uh, or the television will take off its camera from uh, uh, the territories. They will go directly to the refugee camps, to these people that are being kept as cuts for Palestinian political goals for years. And they will, uh, 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 and this will remain as an unsolved issue and will be uh, also, it, it can take the legitimacy of Israel as a Jewish state, again. Yeah, you and I are in agreement. The fact that no one noticed this is beyond uh, my comprehension. Because in Israel it was totally in consensus that no refugee will enter Israel, so they didn't see that underneath there's a process. I'm going to tell you a story. I was in a theater, a man had a heart attack, I was in law school. And there were doctors that I tried to get to help him. And it's a pretty simple thing. No doctor would come to help him. The man died. Why? Because right. they would be sued for negligence. So I wrote a thing called the Good Samaritan Law, which took uh, the, they had to have gross negligence. You would think I was a genius in the world, you know what I mean? That I found a solution between negligence and gross negligence. So what you're saying to me on a greater scale is that everybody takes things for granted and yes. no one probes. Yes. And the difference uh, between a star and a not a star is that door is closed to most people. You see that there's a space underneath you can put an envelope under there. That's why you're successful. Thank you. Tell me, the Christian right, they're really helping Israel. Are you satisfied yes. with them? Yes. Are but you afraid that they'll want a return of Jesus to your homeland? Oh, <laughs> I have more issues to be worried about in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> it's like maybe, maybe we'll, when this will happen, also the Mashiach will come. How does the <coughs> Haredim, the Orthodox, how they treat you in the Knesset and the ministries? Ah, you, you'll never believe it, but now I am... Uh, I am not in charge, but I am now the uh, mediator between Prime Minister Sharon and the ultra Orthodox. Really? Can you wear pants? Yes. They don't bother you? No, 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 no. That's interesting. Yes. They but don't shake I'm your not, hand? No. I, I, I don't offer. I mean, I, I respect them. You understand, them. yeah. I understand, I respect them. As he said, I, I, I believe that this is part of practicing in another way, uh, Judaism. And, uh, and uh, I call Likud party the, uh, the party with the kippah, with the yarmulka in the pocket. <laughs> I mean, we don't worry, I, I mean, the man. But you have a very right-wing guy try to come on the show, Faglin or something, in the Likud party. What's his name? Faglin, yes. Yeah, is he strong in the Likud today? Uh, he is strong uh, within uh, the central committee of the party, unfortunately, because I believe that if he represents something that looks like old liquid, but merely it's uh, an ideology that 
is uh, contradicted to, to, to my values anyway. Is Likud growing in membership? <coughs> yes. We're running out of time. Tell me, what's your day like? How many hours a day you work? 12, 10, as much as I can. How many days a week? Six. We okay. spoke about ultra-orthodox. Yeah. How old are your children? 17 and 14. Are you optimistic for their future in Israel? I have no other alternative. I mean, uh, I believe that they have a future in Israel. I believe in Zionism. I believe in the state of Israel. I believe in the Jewish people, and I believe in my children. Tippi, pleasure to see you. <coughs> You've heard it all from Tippi Livni, a real fighter for the uh, rational side, I would say, of the Likud. And, uh, I guess a lot of people are hoping that she's on the right track and can move the government. Uh, we'll have to watch it. We'll see you next week.